disruption and innovative disruption is nothing new. You know, I went back and started reading about the Industrial Revolution. And that's where you had truly disruptive innovation, where the steam engine was being combined with mechanical looms that were, you know, building um, these big weaving machines, great tapestries, great work, Jacquard's loom it was called, and putting the weavers out of work. Lord Byron, whose daughter is the beginning chapter and ending chapter of this book, Ada Byron Lovelace. Lord Byron was a Luddite. And I mean that literally. The only speech he gave in the House of Lords was supporting the followers of Ned Ludd, the person who was leading the people who were smashing the looms in the Midlands of England because they were putting uh, weavers out of work. And so Ned Ludd and his followers would go around and smash these looms. There was a law that was being proposed in the House of Lords, and Byron fights it because he said, these machines are bad, they're taking work away. His daughter felt differently. His daughter, Ada Byron Lovelace, is one of the most wonderful characters. I think Craig Newmark, was it Craig, are you here? Yeah, Craig Newmark gave me a Ada Lovelace badge just a few moments ago uh, because uh, he saw that I opened with Ada Lovelace. Ada was Lord Byron's daughter. If you know anything about Lord Byron, you will understand fully that Lady Byron was not particularly fond of Lord Byron <laughs> by the time Ada was growing up. And so Lady Byron had Ada tutored only in mathematics, as if that were an antidote to being a romantic poet. <laughs> she ended up loving both poetry and math, poetry and science. And she developed an affection for what she called poetical science. So when she tours the Midlands after hearing of her father's speech against these looms, she looks at the punch cards that are making these tapestries. And she has a friend named Charles Babbage who has created, not really built, but trying to build something called the analytical engine, which is a calculator, a numerical calculator, big old machine calculator. And it used punch cards in order to instruct it what numbers it would process. And Ada's great insight from having looked at these looms and from connecting art to science, the humanities to technology, was that if you use punch cards like that, you could make the machine do anything, not just numbers, but anything, she, uh, the way she put it, that could be notated symbolically. And then she explained what she meant, music, words, tapestries, art. The machine could do everything once you used the punch cards. And that's the basis of the general purpose computer we have today. 1830, she writes the notes on Babbage's analytical engine and does that. And that comes up with this idea, which I think is another lesson of the digital age and innovation, of connect art to technology. When I first started working with Steve Jobs, he said, you know, I was a humanities kid when I was growing up, but I kind of loved electronics as well. And then I read something that Edwin Land, the inventor of Polaroid, said, which is if you stand at that intersection of the arts and technology, that's where the creative uh, value added will occur. And many of you have probably been to, I know there are five people from Apple here tonight, I've already met, maybe even more, have been to the product launches that Steve Jobs did or seen them on YouTube. And at the end, he would always have a slide on the screen behind him, which was just a street sign that said the liberal arts and technology or sciences. He said, that's the intersection where we stand. That's the place that makes our hearts sing. That is another legacy of Ada Lovelace. But Ada had a third concept that's uh, a difficult and subtle one. I tried to write about it in the Wall Street Journal last week. She said, machines will be able to do everything. They'll be able to do music and words and pictures and, you know, tapestry and notes and whatever it may be, but they'll never be able to think. They'll never be creative. They'll never originate creative thought. The humans will have to originate the creative thought. A hundred years to the day almost after that, Alan Turing is... Um, at Bletchley Park, breaking the German Enigma codes, builds the machines that do it, and writes a wonderful paper called The Imitation Game. 
There's a movie coming out in about four weeks called The Imitation Game. Uh, I think I get to meet Kira Knightley because they love my Wall Street Journal piece. And they asked, they called up and they said, would you do a, uh, a panel with Kira? I said, yeah, um, <laughs> I will. And somebody named Benedict Cumberbatch, which some of you may know, but I, apparently he has a big Twitter following because uh, most of the tweets about my book involve Benedict Cumberbatch, who plays Alan Turing in the movie. But anyway, Alan Turing referred this, to this as Lady Lovelace's objection that machines would never be able to think, that they wouldn't have creativity. And he came up with the imitation game to say, how would we know that? How would we believe that that's true? And um, the imitation game, now known as the Turing test, is that you just put a machine and a person in a different room, and you send questions in. And after a while, if you can't tell the difference between the machine and the person, then it makes no sense to say the machine's not thinking. Now, there's a lot of philosophers, including uh, a great one, uh, J.R. Searle here at Berkeley, who say, well, that's a ridiculous test. But Turing said, you know, it's meaningless to say a machine's not thinking if you can't tell it apart from a human, just empirical. Uh, and he said in 20, 30, 40 years, there'll be machines that pass the Turing test. Well, you know what? It's been about 70 years, and the only machines that sort of maybe kind of fake it and pass the Turing test are ones that do sort of gimmicky repose and pretend to be, you know, kids. There's no machine that actually seems to be thinking. And the quest for artificial intelligence, despite what you hear, especially in this area, about the singularity being near when machines will think without us and they won't need us anymore, what has turned out to be true is that Ada Lovelace's vision of combining humans with machines of that combination of human imagination and creativity and machine processing power will always grow faster, she said, than either machines alone or humans alone.